welcome to The New Paradigm for Mankind, a weekly discussion between Lyndon LaRouche and his scientific associates in which we investigate the true nature of the creative human mind and the ideas necessary for the progress of mankind. Hi, today is September 11th, 2013, Wednesday. We're here at the New Paradigm for Mankind show with Lyndon LaRouche and Benjamin Dennison. My name is Leona Fan Chang. We're going to dis- discuss today the idea of the future and knowledge of the future as a driving force of all of mankind's activity, at least the activity that's actually effective. And Benjamin Dennison, why don't you tell us some something about the latest, some of the latest um, news that is actually not news. Yeah, there's been some fun developments around the issue of climate, which I think are worth putting on the table to kind of expand the discussion about what we're dealing with over this next century. Um, The concern that a growing number of scientists are raising is the issue of a potential global cooling where over this next century we could be heading into a period of a cooling of the entire Earth. Some people are even talking about a mini ice age coming in the mid-next century. Now this isn't necessarily set in stone, but it's some things people are raising based upon serious assessments of watching solar activity and looking at the current trends in climate. What we know for certain, either way the climate goes, what we know for certain is the biggest challenge we have is the Anglo-Dutch Empire and this whole environmentalist paradigm. Now they've been promoting this fraud of global warming which has been a political issue not a scientific issue. Uh, The Queen made this very clear at the Copenhagen summit in 2009 when she said it is our role as the British Commonwealth to impose this policy of supranational carbon control population reduction upon the world Uh, This is our policy, and it's purely a population reduction paradigm, and they use the lie of global warming to try and ram this policy through. They've said repeatedly and clearly their intention is to reduce the world population down to a level of 1 billion people or less from the current level of 7 plus billion people. So that's their stated explicit intention, and the whole fraud around global warming has been used as a line to try and push through that policy. Now, the problem is reality has been intervening into their lives. And I want to go through just some of this uh, recent discussion on this. The Daily Telegraph had a recent report. This, this year has been filled with increasing reports, people asking, where is the warming? Where is the global warming? Because it's being increasingly recognized that as we can... <coughs> see here, uh, there's a concern that there hasn't been any warming since 1997. If you see here, the graph's a little bit messy, but this is one measure of temperature, which is satellite measurements. So you have satellites measuring the um, uh, infrared radiation coming from the Earth and measuring the temperature of the uh, lower atmosphere, the surface of the Earth. And what you can see here in this graph from 1980 to 2012, they've highlighted in red and pink a period, a warming period, which peaks around 1997. And then since then, from 97 to today, it's either leveled off. Some reports show it's gone up just a little bit. Other reports indicate it's gone down a little bit. Now, this has been... uh, admitted now by the head of the IPCC, their scientific head has admitted that we have, they're calling it the pause, the global warming pause. (laughs) We're having trouble explaining the pause. We can't explain why there's this pause in the global warming. That's the phrase being used. Uh, The New York Times covered this in June. Uh, They said, just to quote their coverage of it, they said the rise in surface temperature of the earth has been remarkably slower over the last 15 years. Uh, compared to the 20 years before that. And the low in warming has occurred even as greenhouse gases have accumulated in the atmosphere at a record pace. 
So that's the big anomaly these guys are trying to explain away now. You can also see in the graph that CO2 has continued to rise, but it has not driven an increase in temperature. So uh, there's also a big hubbub because it was leaked that the uh, UK Met Office also is investigating this and wondering why is there no global warming, what's with the stop in global warming. So there's a lot of issues around this. And one thing the environmentalists are trying to do, which they're very, very good at, is trying to confuse and intimidate the population by throwing on a whole bunch of more layers of added complexity. And they're saying, well, if you measure a different part of the atmosphere, it's different. Or if you measure the oceans, it's different there. And there's a whole lot of fluff being thrown around this. But increasingly over the past years, this is becoming an issue that more and more people are recognizing they have to face, that the same measures of temperature they've been using the last decades to claim that there's warming is no longer showing warming. Now, the Earth's climate is an incredibly complex process, which reaches much beyond the Earth itself. And while I think there's a lot of open questions as to what exactly are all the mechanisms of interrelation, one thing we do know is if we're going to have any understanding of the activity of the Earth's climate, we have to look at the sun. And this gets into some of the forecasts of a potential period of global cooling. Now, uh, since 2006, there's a Russian team out of uh, the Pokoko, uh, Pokokov Observatory in St. Petersburg, which has been warning that based upon their long-term forecasts of solar activity, that uh, we're going to be heading into a period of cooling in this century and potentially a minim, mi, uh, uh, mini ice age sometime around the middle of the century. Now, they were issuing this warning in uh, 2006, as early as that. I think there was some discussions earlier. But they put out this forecast in 2006. Now, there we go. One thing that's looked at as a major indication of this solar activity is sunspot observations, which give you an indication of the activity of the sun. Now, the sun goes on an 11-year cycle where there is a period of increasing sunspot activity. You can actually see these spots on the surface of the sun. And it rises to a peak where you have the most sunspots, and then it falls to a minimum. And the cycle varies. You know, sometimes it's 10 years, sometimes it's a little bit longer, 12, 13 years. But on average, you have this 11-year cycle. Now, from cycle to cycle, as you can see here, in this record, the cycles actually vary in intensity. Some cycles are overall more intense. Other cycles are overall less intense. Um, you go back far enough, you have periods uh, such as the Maunder Minimum, in which there were no sunspots observed for an extended period of time, which was associated with a period of intense cooling across the Earth. Um, major cooling and freezing in regions of Europe that normally don't get freezing. It was a very cold period on the planet, which, which we can see clearly was associated with a period of low solar activity. So based upon examining longer term cycles in the sun, this Russian team had been warning in 2006 that we could be heading into a cooling period. Now, uh, a little bit so now we're, we're right now in the middle of another solar cycle. Now, the early forecasts for this solar cycle, again, this is the number of sunspots, which give you an idea how active the sun is. The earlier, the last solar cycle, you could see peaked around um, between 100 and 125 sunspots uh, at the peak. The early forecast for this current cycle were going to be that we'd have about the same level of activity, about as an intense solar cycle as the last one. Um, but what we saw as the last solar cycle trailed off was that they revised the forecast, mm -hmm. say this is going to be an actually very weak solar cycle we're going into. So around uh, 
2008, 2009, 2010, NASA and other people started saying, well, this next solar cycle is looking increasingly weaker. Um, in 2011, uh, uh, the uh, American Astronomical Society put out a release looking at a number of different studies measuring the uh, strength of the magnetic intensity of sunspots, measuring the uh, structure of the atmosphere of the sun, measuring the uh, subsurface structure of the sun, three completely different sets of observations, which they said all point to a weakening solar cycle. And they said this next solar cycle could be, uh, would be relatively weak. And the solar cycle after that might not even have any sunspots at all. Or if it does, it might just be even weaker, fewer sunspots. And as we've seen, so this was 2011 that they issued this forecast. Now in 2013, hmm. we see that the observations have been consistent with these forecasts and warnings. Well, they look lower. Yeah. They're actually lower than their low forecasts. Right. So they had a higher forecast. They revised it to a lower forecast for the intensity of the solar cycle. And then as we progress through that solar cycle, the actual observations are even less than this lower forecast. Um, so the point is, the possible projections based on this activity, again, here's another plot of a longer term view of solar cycles. Um, based upon these solar observations, the uh, view is that we are, could be exiting what was a period of warming due to intense in, in, uh, increased solar activity. And we could be entering a period in which we're going to go to a longer term minimum of solar activity, which will lead to a major period of global cooling. Now, this Russian team in 2012 issued a forecast where they said, uh, based upon their understanding, between about 2014 and 2055 will be a period of moving into a cooling, cooling period, which will reach its um, minimum level, the coolest level, about 2040, give or take some number of years. Um, so this isn't a completely set in stone prediction, but it is, does raise serious questions about uh, what we're going to have to do to continue to live in uh, a nice, habitable environment on the planet Earth. Um, we know for certain, you know, whether or not this exact forecast plays out exactly the way it is or not, we know for certain the whole global warming CO2 thing is driven by a political uh, motivation, and we should not be concerned about destroying the planet because we want to increase living standards. Well, you know how you know also is that every time there's a change from warming, every time there's evidence that it, the, the globe is not warming, they say, well, humans are still causing climate change. Right. Which actually I think is more revealing because they're actually campaigning against change itself. Right. Which is absurd, because if you look at the history of the Earth, I mean, it's gone through wild changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we know for certain is there's been periods when the ice, when the Earth was almost completely covered in ice, periods when it was much, much hotter than it is now. And we have no reason to believe it's not going to continue to go through cycles of intense variation one way or the other. We know it's not going to be driven by CO2 emissions from human beings, that's for sure. But it just poses a much broader challenge. What does mankind need to be doing to be thinking about uh, managing the earth and keeping decent conditions for mankind and for life on the earth as a whole. And I think this gets is another way to emphasize the importance of what we've launched with this trans-Pacific program centered around a fusion-driven program, that the mankind today needs a fusion economy. We need to rapidly move into an economy where you have a much higher level of energy flux density per capita, a much powerful human economic system where we can handle and even think about beginning to uh, control these types of processes. But it will never happen under the green paradigm and the uh, 
what's on the table now with what we're what we're have as an option with the NAWAPA system, the Continental Water Management System running from the Mississippi River all the way to the Pacific, the potential to bring this uh, development, in addition to the water system, bring a development of uh, high-speed rail, transportation, nuclear power, all the way through the Bering Strait through the Arctic, and link up with nations such as China, South Korea, Japan, Russia, where you also have factions in these countries that want to move towards this fusion economy, that want to increase mankind's living standards, uh, ability, uh, uh, ability to control and develop the planet for the betterment of mankind. They want to go away from this insane zero growth system that's been imposed on the world and has been, uh, right now is bringing us to the point of utter collapse. So I think these are the types of issues. Again, it's not a question of exactly what's going to happen, but we know for certain that if mankind doesn't move in this direction and develop a full fusion economy capability and begin to look at the Earth from the standpoint of the entire solar system mm -hmm. as defining what happens on Earth, then we can guarantee that mankind's not going to have any continued existence on this planet. So I think that adds another element to the future orientation that we're talking about. We're thinking about how is mankind going to manage the entire Earth systems from the standpoint of the solar system as a whole, and what gives mankind the capability to do that. And it has to be fusion looking towards things like matter-antimatter reactions as a type of orientation that we need to push now to think about and deal with all these types of things. The other thing that, it, that fusion always calls to mind is the idea of being a, 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 a non-terrestrial, non-exclusively terrestrial species. And what you've brought up now with, for example, the solar cycles, and then of course, what's possibly causing the solar cycles themselves. Mm -hmm. um, this brings in galactic questions. Yeah, exactly. Right. We we have we know of, uh, there are galactic cycles. We have some track on what they are, what they seem to be, and therefore these galactic conditions actually are going to determine what the solar function is. Mm -hmm. And we have some very sharp indications of, of of that in terms of galactic causes for changes in the solar characteristics. Mm -hmm. And we have to look at this more ref in a refined way because we've got to look at different aspects of within the solar system which are affected by other considerations than the ones we've taken on into account now. Mm -hmm. For example, Saturn, Jupiter, which are large places which have anything that in the solar system is going to have an effect is mm -hmm. more closely affected by the Jupiter and Saturn than it is by anything near, near yeah. Earth. Right. It, has, it should have a, a solar system-wide effect if it's yes. being affected from the outside. Mm -hmm. And these are, these are pressures which come on the uh, solar system from galactic considerations because the solar system is controlled by galactic system and that we have a system beyond that we know much less about the, the higher system. So the point is, is, as mankind increases our, the energy flux density of the impact of mankind by going to higher energy flux densities inherently, this is a, a, a control mechanism available on all of these considerations. Control is from the standpoint of studying these larger considerations as well as other things. Mm -hmm. it's, the question is not what the sun is going to do. What can we do to the sun? What can we do to the solar system or other parts of it? How can we change that? And obviously, if we're going to at energy these higher uh, characteristics, uh, now we're going thermonuclear fusion. Then we're going to be going to matter and antimatter questions. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we have to think about this man's role in intervening, which we're now doing. We, we aren't we destroying ourselves when we're not increasing energy flux density? We, because the more mankind is able to control energy flux density, the more we can sit on Earth and change things 
without worrying too much about a, a shift in the solar system. Mm -hmm. You know what the, the global warming and global cooling people uh, remind me of are those, uh, the rain dances. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> Some mysterious force that you should, you should pray to. I think that's, that's a, you think we've got to well, throw in on this thing, is throw mm -hmm. these considerations in. Because actually what we're talking about, we have, first of all, excellent reasons for going to thermonuclear fusion now, period. All kinds of reasons. But then we have the ability to say it goes into another factor, that if we're increasing the energy flux density effectively on the surface of the Earth, even there, which we can do with thermonuclear fusion, we will have an effect with that with thermonuclear fusion. Mm -hmm. Once we get it into controllable relationships, we will. Right. And th this is what we have to look at. And the question of the effect on water, mm -hmm. the primary thing we deal with now is the question of the relationship of the water function, the moisture function, in, ter in terms of going to thermonuclear fusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, water has two roles in this one, both what we discussed with Nawapa 21, but also what we've been discussing about using ocean water, which is right now not a resource, yeah. as a main source of power. Yeah. And then the, uh, you know, what would be a better idea, way of understanding the sun than to create a sun? Right. Than to, than to actually reproduce the effects that are on the sun. Yeah or are the sun here on Earth mm -hmm. in a controlled fashion? It's obvious that we need this thermonuclear fusion, just what we're saying right now. Thermonuclear fusion and it's as an application by mankind to Earth itself and to the effects of Earth being affected by that. Mm -hmm. Like the moon that changes. <laughs> the moon will change. <laughs> and so I think we, we, what we have to do is actually uh, just exactly that. We know we have to go with thermonuclear fusion on all kinds of grounds. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything that's, that's been suggested that's negative in that thing. Well, it keeps going back to the fundamental issue that you keep emphasizing, which is people's understanding of what mankind really is. <clears throat> what is man, what, 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 how can a thermonuclear mankind improve the territory of the inner solar system? That's how we should be thinking about it. Yeah. Mankind is the creative force in the solar system that can improve this entire territory. It's our, in a sense, obligation, our moral obligation, to act as a creative force and continue to increase our ability to do that. And we've seen with a shocking effect on us in considering this business is that going to a thermonuclear fusion now is a, a galactic, a quasi-galactic effect. Mm -hmm. Because you're changing the mold. It's, it's quasi-galactic, yeah. not galactic, but right. quasi-galactic. Mm -hmm. And that change means you're changing everything. And you have more means, you have more options, different kinds of options that you can derive from that. Mm -hmm. And also, if you can change the uh, characteristic of production on the planet, mm -hmm. if you take all these regions, you know, like uh, Siberia, for example, if you start to change Siberia's characteristics, and you have a, a Chinese implication on this one of trying to go to the Arctic Ocean. We have in China, they're making these sh ships which are going to a place that nobody goes to for, from China. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're, if you're doing that, and you're moving, the, changing the temperature, controlled temperature of different sections of the planet, mm -hmm. you're changing everything. But the need, you have to have the means to do it, and that means it's thermonuclear fusion. Right. That's an effective, since, you know, essentially since the beginning of the 1970s, thermonuclear fusion has been on the table for development. Mm -hmm. And I, that's where we have to go. Yeah, we just had an interview yesterday with Marsha Freeman, and she mentioned this, uh, this drive in South Korea, Japan, and China for fusion. And she said the difference between what the way that they're doing it and everyone else is that they do see it as a, a requirement. Yeah. It's not an option. It's something that human beings have to do. It's not a power play and it really is just 
they, they do see it, see it as not an option to not go for fusion. And what about Kamchatka? <laughs> What's that? Kamchatka. <laughs> That's a nice little volcanic place to, to right. work in. <laughs> As I think it has a lot of eruptions. Yeah. <laughs> People have not been too, too eager to get on there <laughs> because of these eruptions, earthquakes and whatnot. We had played with a wild idea yesterday or the day before on the volcanic eruptions yeah. uh, because that's something that we don't control right now. We don't have an ability to, de one, even determine when they're going to erupt. We could sort of have a, a general forecast and definitely um, how they erupt or anything we like that. We had some work being done in that direction. It got dropped in the basement. Well, you know, and then it came up um, because we were discussing uh, PNEs. Yeah. We were discussing these nuclear explosives and tunneling. And then how, uh, and this is discussed in the report, and that when we were investigating, um, well, when we were doing these tunneling projects and actively in, engaged in the plowshare program, we were also learning a lot about the structure of the earth because you know how much explosive you put in and then you measure how much, what the effect is. And therefore, between there, you can triangulate then what the the structure of the earth is. And we discussed really, it's through these type of um, investigations that you will find, for example, what is deep down there right now yeah. mm -hmm. that is, that all, right now are all still just theory about how volcanoes and earthquakes are made or created and affect the rest of the globe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, we need this idea that it is man's obligation to improve the territory. That's what the whole NAWAPA program is. We're going to use the driver of thermonuclear power to, increase the, to improve the territory of the entire North American continent. We're going to use the Trans-Pacific orientation as the driver for the entire world on this system. I think the point is we're not putting enough emphasis on the importance of the Mars relationship. The Mars relationship is important in, because it's the beyond um, asteroids, the large asteroids and that kind of problem. Mm -hmm. That Mars is the looking at it sanely, not looking at it as a place for future distant habitation, but looking at it in the relationship, the ac active relationship between Earth and Mars, which is posed, uh, posed to us now. Mm -hmm. And we have to think about not putting people on Mars, which has been the criteria, like as a distance planet, can you put something on this planet? Has it got a temperature and climate you can use? Mm -hmm. That's not the question. The question is, can, the question is, these asteroids. Our problem is we have to be able to control this asteroid belt, or these belts, asteroid belts. Mm -hmm. And therefore we have an immediate mission orientation, which come, has all the other implications as well, that we have to have a defense of Earth. And the defense of Earth means we have to have cooperation, in effect, fr from Mars. <laughs> so the, the issue of Mars is not the man on Mars. That's a distant thing. You don't want to talk about a century from now. Maybe we can get, get to some point of that type. <clears throat> but r right now, we have no way of saying that Mars is manned uh, as a manned planet for us. It is not. What it's manned is if we can put things on Mars which are like defenses of, of asteroids. Mm -hmm. And you have, we have a whole asteroid control problem, which is extremely important. And also, we will ch we'll find that we can change the way we think. Look, we are functioning on Earth in, with great defect, a great defect. Mm -hmm. We are using climate. We're using sense perception as a way of understanding our planet. Mm -hmm. Now, sense perception is a piece of idiocy if you want to use it for actual scientific purposes. Hmm? It's, it, because it's, it, sense perception is a, is a very peculiar thing, does not do, do with physics. It's specific to the climate on Earth. It was designed, in a sense, by that. Mm -hmm. hmm? So people rely on climate 
as if that controls the, the solar system. And we don't, we, we, we measure the performance of, of objects offside, out beyond man, man mm -hmm. as being uh, that, sort of some, some kind of principle, mm -hmm. and it's not. S sense perception is not a reliable principle for understanding the galactic processes. But we use it. But man, that's only something mankind uses. And in science, you don't use this kind of climate as such, as a standard. Mm -hmm. But we do, because we use sense perception, which is a very poor quality of instrument for measuring what's, uh, measuring what's going on in the, in the solar system. There's a good inversion, which is that we use sense perception to to say that we have galactic effects on Earth, mm. or we use this, we use this, it to, we use it to say that uh, there's effects, there are changes in the sun which affect the Earth, and that likely the changes in the sun are coming from changes outside of the sun or the solar system. Now, if you do the inversion, though, that part at this point would be a hypothesis and can't be sensed, which is if human beings conquer the process of fusion and basically the, the, the process of creating a star, then what does that have, what kind of effect does that have reciprocally? Because you find the greatest uh, it, it discoveries are, ma are made beyond that idea of sense perception. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking at, you need to have Mars, you need to have Mars as an experimental point for us because we've got to free ourselves of dependency upon sense perception, animal sense perception. We need to get beyond that. It's sort of like the infancy of, of the human mind is, is sense perception. Mm -hmm. But it's very convenient for the oligarchical system because if you can degrade people to dependency on sense perception, like weather as such, the experience of weather as such, you can control them. Mm -hmm. You control the minds of people. And they, they feel secure because the weather is the thing that's closest to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Adam Smith, for example, is explicit on this mm -hmm. in his doctrines defining what economics is. He says people should not even bother worrying about causes mm -hmm. and just respond to your senses of pleasure Pain. pain, and that's all you need to do, and then good things will come out of your responding to your biological yeah. immediate environment. It's explicitly the doctrine of the empire. Well, that's been, that's been the major block. The, the British policy has been the major block to dealing with the fact of the fa fallacies inherent in sense perception. For example, discoveries, discoveries of principle, mm -hmm. discoveries of real physical principle, these occur completely independent of anything like a climate consideration. And all the important discoveries in modern times are made on that basis of, no, sense perception is not a reliable indicator. It is something you use because it's, it's a crude instrument. If you want to know it's going to rain tonight or, or tomorrow, you can use sense perception. If you want to discover how the solar system functions, you don't want to use sense perception. Mm -hmm. You don't have a sense equivalent of sense perception in the solar system as such. Mm -hmm. what, what sense perception did Kepler use to discover the harmonic organization of the whole solar system? Well, that was the whole, that's why people are screwed up on Kepler, for just that reason. Mm -hmm. They call it mysticism, because it's something that's not sense perception. No. Like like the, his famous you know his famous principle is is not does not fit any of these categories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a great fun with that, you know, and sense perception, because human se look you've got you say human sense perception. Now look at biologically what human sense perception is, huh? and you say this is nonsense. I'm so, because we can change. We have other me other means for understanding the universe, and none of them go with the idea of weather-oriented sense perception. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when man makes a discovery, a principle, mankind does something that no animal species can do, 
And that's the crucial point. What's the difference between the mind of the human being and the mind of the animal? Animals do not have a discovery a capability of discovering a principle. They have a way of interpreting a discovered a, a principle, huh? mm -hmm. reacting to. And but the function of mankind has always been uh, kept uh, the whole business with Kepler's dis uh, question huh? on this question is his, his, his he is deliberately misinterpreted consistently precisely because they want to adapt to this idea of mankind is limited to sense perception. Mm -hmm. Mm. And our job is to get beyond that. Our job is to change our view immediately in approximation of the solar system because we've got this, these damn asteroids to deal with, among other things. Therefore, we have to have an ability and discover what the ability is to get beyond weather and to get into the what is going on in the solar system. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, and the best first, best thing to do is go to two things, asteroids and Mars. These are the two things which are most conveniently available to us. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is get some experiments up there. We need to use Mars, but we need it for that reason, mm -hmm. not for trying to figure out how man can settle there. To get mankind physically adapted to the to Mar to a Mars climate, gravity, and so forth, this is a really a, a, a tough job. It's not one we're going to take on right away. Well, it's we, not, are, we couldn't even solve it from now. No, we can. But we can deal with asteroids, mm -hmm. and we can get Mars as a part of the panoply of capabilities we might call upon by putting instruments on Mars, which will help us deal with that kind of problem. Mm -hmm. So many of these asteroids are outside, or in the, the Mars belt, the Mars orbit, just like ours. These are the things we should worry about. Mm -hmm. Asteroids, this is a living problem right now, asteroid, asteroid defense. And we need to get the means in which we can, and we need Mars as a base operation, because it's the only planet nearby to us, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. from which we can actually deal with, with the asteroids, as apart from just the asteroids themselves. We don't have a good measure of the, how the asteroids are, are determined, how this, because it's a complex system, which have intergravitational inter kinds of considerations. We don't have a good map of this thing. If we want to defend mankind on Earth, you've got to get some help. And we've got to put some bases on, on Mars, which, which we can coordinate with Earth on observations. So you put artificial systems on Mars, not people, but artificial systems. We have shown we can do that. We have people whose minds work in that direction. So therefore, we can make Mars a, a very important observatory uh, in the solar system for us for dealing with all kinds of problems, including particularly asteroids. Because Mars has an asteroid problem, a big one. Hmm. Look at all the look at all the things that have hit Mars. They yeah. have, don't have a protective atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Well, that's bad, but that's useful to us because now we get a better picture of how the asteroid system works, and we, we put instruments on Mars to discover that we're going to find a properly you know very low density atmosphere in Mars. And you're going to be able to get a better bead on how some of these large asteroids function. Mm -hmm. But you need to set a crossfire to do that. You've got to create a system. You've got to put things there out in space and so forth. Better observatories. Yeah, we know far less than 1% of all the asteroids in our neighborhood. Right, so less that's than 1%. 1%. That's our biggest, our biggest threat that we know of of this type. And a lot of the ones that we think we know about, we, have very, we just have a few pictures of them. And they give an extrapolation of what they think the orbit is, but we, it's relatively we had, imprecise. We had a good scientist from Hungary who was concerned with that and got turned down by his friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Teller was pushing this as a major international effort. So that we should put that back on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we need. These guys are idiots because they're appropriating everything on the, this, this way, they're looking at the things from the wrong standpoint. We're not going to, we're not, our objective is not putting man on Mars. Our objective is putting instruments on Mars which will do the job for man. 
period. And what are the instruments going to be used for? And the key thing we have is a problem out there is these damned asteroids. Mm -hmm. And we need an asteroid defense system. You know, one thing is that the asteroid belt, the Mars, ast the, the belt, the yeah. one that we actually right now call a belt, um, gives us a lot of insight into the way that, that the solar system is shaped. And from what we know about, for example, the gaps in the belt, the, the Hildas, and some of these seemingly anomalies, um, we, can we can start to get a shape of how Jupiter, for example, what Jupiter's effect actually really is, mm -hmm. not just right around the vicinity of Jupiter, but throughout the solar system. And the asteroids serve as sort of the, um, the iron pieces in a magnetic field, where they give you a, a picture of something that is, is, is invisible, yeah. mm -hmm. especially invisible to, um, for uh, effects that we don't, or we don't already know. Mm -hmm. When you're looking for principles you don't already know, you have these as your guide. And I think if we approached the inner belt, if you could call it that, the, yeah. uh, the asteroids within Mars orbit that way, we can find out a lot about how they orbit, what determines their orbits, and, and start to conquer them in that way as well. This means planning instrumentation. Yeah. Hmm. So that's our function is not to try to put people on, on Mars as such, as if we're, that's some kind of a human objective. We have to take charge of Mars, and we have to take charge of the asteroid belt. Mm -hmm. well, I think taking charge of Mars is also, it means much more than Mars, as you mentioned before. Yeah. It really is the whole entire orbit in and being able to freely, uh, I guess you could say, civilize mm. uh, the inner Mars orbit. Because yep. it's not just going to be Earth and then Mars mm. as two places of instrumentation. Mm -hmm. But as we've done between Earth and the Sun, where we've now planted several instruments, we need to do that type of, uh, that type of popular, um, population increase, I guess you could say, yeah. within the inner orbit. Mm -hmm. So we have to change the definition of mankind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is to realize what mankind really is and what mankind is being prevented from understanding by stupid, stupid presumptions. Mm. <laughs> yeah. We have to create, as we found, instruments which we put out there on assignment and we teach them by electronic and related means, we, we teach them how to behave themselves. Mm -hmm. And we get them, extract information from them in that way. <laughs> and you take them in piece by piece, in phase, you take them in totality. Mm -hmm. You take the, play the phases against the totality. Mm -hmm. Usual thing, the same things we would always think, do. You, know? you, you break things down between phases and totalities of phases. Mm -hmm. huh? And you take the interaction between the phases and the totality. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to do. We urgently need to do that. And we need to be able to send stuff there faster, so which we needs what thermonuclear fusion as a device for getting things into the vicinity of Mars that we want to put there quickly. This is the, we're doing now, this is a long waiting job. Yeah. <laughs> and getting getting answers back, very long, mm -hmm. tedious. <laughs> it reminds me of before we had, um, or during the colonial days, when we had to send letters back and forth to England, right. so it would take three months there and three months back. Yeah. By that time, the war is over. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> because we, we have, a, with, instead of trying to do the things that NASA was trying to do before, and the way they were approaching it, the mistake was that they were, had the wrong assignment. Mm -hmm. The assignment was put somebody on Mars. That was the assignment. How quickly can man get on Mars? How can we live in other areas? Well, that's not the immediate question. The immediate question is how can we put devices which we can now design and place on Mars and place on selected asteroids mm -hmm. and now, now use that to get our information, which means we've got to get more accelerated 
uh, information system, mm -hmm. which means you need a thermonuclear fusion drive just to get out there to do the job of, of observing things. Mm -hmm. You need to put them in orbit. Thermonuclear driver, put them in orbit. Put the observers in orbit. Now, uh, electronics, the speed of light, is about the best we can do. And well, that's for our information channels. So now we have to create a crossfire mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and start measuring the crossfires. Take them by phase and take them by totality. Phases by totality. Mm -hmm. And that we can do. That's something conceptually we can do. We just need to train more people to think that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had, we had approached this past report with the idea that minimally we plan with a, a four-generation uh, scope in yeah. mind. But if you look at what Ben presented today on the solar cycles, that was minimally 400 years. So four times that uh, of a scope to plan for. And I think as we get into it, as we progress, our, our scope of uh, future orientation will continue to expand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think now is the time to do it. Yes. Now is the time to put that on the table and push it. Because we're now going with the need for the thermonuclear fusion operation. And that's what goes with it. It's not just the control of the weather system, but water system. It's the control of information systems. Because you have to put up artificial information systems in order to be able to control this process you're trying to examine efficiently. Mm -hmm. mm. So we need to get stupidity off the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good place to end. We all get stupidity off the agenda. Okay, that's it for today. Join us next time.